Hello. We're having another taping of a TV talk show out of COP21, which we call Climate Matters. Um, can we get the uh, video feed on onto the uh, screens, please? Oh, I'm sorry. We've got it on one side. I'm looking at the wrong side. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm the host today. Coming to you live, obviously, from COP21. You'll forgive me for having to look over my shoulder, but last year I could have my computer here, and now it has to be back there, so no video feeds. Um, I, I'll give you my email address at the end of the presentation also if you'd like to be in touch. I can relay questions if we don't get to them from that you might have for Dr. Hansen. And obviously, uh, those of you who are here know an icon of climate change, Dr. James Hansen, who I believe sounded the alarm. He's the Paul Revere of the climate change movement. Um, and he's here with us today. It's the first time he's ever attending the COP. These are uh, hashtags if you're tweeting on the live simulcast or the webcast in the future. Please use these hashtags. And the topic today, which I extracted from an email in my chain with Dr. Hansen, is speaking truth to power. And that'll give us quite a lot of latitude. Oh. Well, I had a... Uh, That's the 2009 book that Dr. Hansen wrote, Storms of My Grandchildren. Um, and you can read the subtitle. It's quite shocking. And this was 2009. We've come quite a bit further in, in climate change. We haven't come a whole lot further in the negotiations, one might argue. But um, I would like to start off a discussion. I'm going to let Dr. Hansen take it after my initial question. Um, I asked. Dr. Hansen, before, if he'd disambiguate for us between 2 degrees C, which is what is appearing in the press day in, day out when, when they talk about climate change, and 1.5 degrees C, which is just beginning to appear now in the text and not yet made it to the media. Dr. Hansen, would you disambiguate those for us? Well, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks very much, Stuart. Actually, I prefer not to speak in terms of uh, temperature targets, uh, but rather uh, atmospheric composition targets. And in 2008, I wrote a paper with several of the um, top relevant experts in the world in carbon cycle, uh, paleoclimate, climate modeling, and the relevant disciplines, and we concluded that we should be aiming for no more than about 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And since that time, we've achieved remarkably accurate measurements of the Earth's energy imbalance. And what we found is that the planet is out of balance, as you would expect. When you add CO2 to the atmosphere, it reduces heat radiation to space. Therefore, we have more energy coming in from the sun than heat being radiated to space. And it turns out that that imbalance, which is about six-tenths of a watt per meter squared averaged over the entire planet, land and ocean, implies that you would need to reduce CO2 from the present 400 ppm to about 350 ppm to restore energy balance. And that's what you need uh, uh, to stabilize climate. And Dr. Hansen, that, so point, that the, 0.6 ppm, you've compared that to 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs per day? Oh, the, the amount of energy is 0.6 watts per meter square doesn't sound like much, but if you convert it to the number of Hiroshima atomic bombs, it's about 400,000 uh, per day every day of the year. So it's a lot of energy. It's going into the ocean, and that's 
uh, warming ocean is the source of the biggest threat that we face, and that is the melting of the ice shelves around Antarctica and Greenland, which then speeds up the loss of mass from the ice sheets and the sea level rise. Um, Would but you like I to switch we, over? Let's, let's go to Would my, you change uh, to Dr. Hansen's uh, computer for his slides, please? Yeah, so I, w I would like to talk about uh, climate justice and governmental honesty. How can we achieve that? And uh, it's not easy. Could I have the next uh, chart? Um, that doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope that they there figure this out. Just can you advance to the next slide? There we go. There we go. Yeah, the, you know, our parents did not know that they were causing a problem for future generations by burning fossil fuels. But we can only pretend that we don't know. Uh, and it's, it's a difficult thing for the public to recognize because the climate changes only slowly because of the inertia of the system. Uh, the danger is, because the planet is now out of energy balance, there's more warming that's in the pipeline without any additional gases, and that's going to take us up to and into dangerous uh, territory. Uh, we're on the edge of handing our children a climate system in which consequences will be out of their control. For example, disintegration of ice sheet and sea level rise of many meters, which would mean we would lose all coastal cities, and more than half of the largest cities in the world are on coastlines. That's the one injustice from one generation to another. The second is north to south, because Almost all the greenhouse gases have been added by countries in the north, but the biggest consequences are actually at low latitudes, where the, the warming is already making it uncomfortable in the summer and making it difficult to work outdoors. Uh, so there's a, a north to south injustice. Uh, and uh, there, there's one species humans that are taking over the planet and threatening the existence of as much as a quarter to a half of the other species on the planet. That's the estimate of the IPCC for the, end of the, the number of species that would be committed to extinction by the end of this century if we stay on business as usual. So these are the injustices. Could I have the next uh, chart? Um, Today, China is the biggest emitter, and the United States second, and India third. But it's not today's emissions that cause the climate change. It's the integrated emissions over time, the cumulative emissions. And for that, the United States is responsible for more than one quarter. Europe is responsible for more than one quarter. China for 10 percent, India for 3 percent, and so on. But even that, could I have the next chart? Even that exaggerates the uh, responsibility of uh, the developing countries. If you look at the per capita contribution to cumulative emissions, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Germany are by far the most responsible. China is an order of magnitude smaller. And India's contribution is so small it almost disappears on this chart. Could I have the next one? The problem is that fossil fuels appear to the consumer to be the cheapest energy. They're not really cheapest because they don't include their full cost to society. They're partially subsidized, but mainly they don't include the effects of air pollution and water pollution on human health. If your child gets asthma, you have to pay the bill. The fossil fuel company doesn't. And the climate effects, which are beginning to be significant and will be much larger in the future, are also not included in the uh, 
price of the fossil fuels. So the solution would be fairly straightforward. Let's add into the price of fossil fuels the, the, the total cost, which you can't do suddenly, but you can do it gradually over time so that you can, people have uh, time to adjust. Could I have the next one? So I argue that this should be done, uh, it has to be across the board, across all fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, at the source, the domestic mine or the port of entry. And I also argue that that money should be given to the public, give an equal amount to all legal residents of the country. That way the person who does better than average in limiting their carbon footprint will actually make money. And in fact, two-thirds of the people uh, would come out ahead. And it would also address the growing income inequality in the world, which is occurring in almost all countries, because the low-income people would tend to uh, have a lower carbon footprint. People who fly around the world and have big houses would pay more, but they can afford to do that. Uh, could I have the next one? So that's, that's a uh, transparent market-based solution, a conservative solution, which stimulates the economy. The economic studies in the United States uh, show that after 10 years, if you added $10 a ton of CO2 carbon fee, distributed the money to the public, after 10 years it would reduce emissions 30 percent, and after 20 years more than 50 percent. And it would spur the economy, creating more than 3 million new jobs. Uh, so. Furthermore, this is the only viable international approach. You cannot ask each of 190 countries to individually limit their emissions. We, what we have to do is have the price of fossil fuels honest. That requires only a few of the major players to agree, let's have a rising co uh, common uh, carbon fee, and those countries that don't want to have that fee will put a border duty on products from those countries, and furthermore, we will rebate to our manufacturers the carbon fee when they export a, a product to a non-participating uh, non nation. So this, economists agree, is a fair way to do it, and it could rapidly move us off of fossil fuels. Can I have the Be next one? Before we leave that point, you've pointed out that if three major economies did this, all other nations would be forced to go along. Well, almost all would go along because they would rather collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at our borders. So it's a very simple way to give you a, a, a control of, of the system. Could I have uh, the next one, please? But what we are hearing is uh, although uh, Christiana Figueres says uh, many have said we need a carbon price and investment would be so much easier with a carbon price, but life is much more complex than that. Um, could I have the next one? So what we're talking about instead is the same old thing, the same old thing that was tried in Kyoto, asking each country to promise, oh, I'll reduce my emissions, I will cap my emissions, I'll reduce them 20% or whatever they decide is their, they can do. You know, in science, when you do a well-controlled experiment and get a well-documented result, you expect that if you do the experiment again, you're going to get the same result. So why are we talking about doing the same thing again? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to be use crude language, but I learned this from my mother, so I'll use it anyway. This, this, uh, this is half-assed, and it's half-baked. It's half-assed because there's no way to make it global. You have to beg each nation. So I, I went to Germany to, to speak with um, 
was hoping to speak to Merkel, but I got cut off at um, Sigmar Gabriel, a minister. Uh, and, um, you know, I said, well, he, he said, oh, we're going to do cap and trade, cap and trade with offsets. And I said, that, that, that won't work. We've tried that. Uh, and so I said, what's the cap on India? And, and he said, we'll tighten our carbon cap. Well, it, uh, Germany is now 2% of the world emissions, so him tightening the German carbon cap is not going to solve the problem. You've got to have something that will work globally. And it's half-baked because there's no, there's no enforcement mechanism. So if, if this is... Um, We have to, what I, I think are, you know, what I hear is all the ministers are coming here or the heads of state and they're planning to clap each other on the back and say, oh, we're really doing great. We're, this is a very successful conference and we're going to address the climate problem. Well, I'm, what, if, if that's what happens, then we're screwing the next generation and the following ones, because we're being stupid in doing the same thing again that we did, what, 18 years ago? Uh, you you we, pointed out last night that if one nation, even a large nation, does a cap and forces down their emissions, that also forces down demand, yeah, forces down price. Yeah, Would you yeah. so what's the effect of, uh, you know, you try very hard and you say, okay, we're going to reduce our nation's emissions. Well. Or an individual reduces their emissions. The, one effect of that is to reduce the demand for the product and keep the price low. As long as fossil fuels are dirt cheap, they will keep being used. It's like burning coal is like burning dirt. You just take a bulldozer and you can bulldoze it out of the ground. It's very cheap, but you, it does not include its cost to society. It's a very dirty fuel with some negative effects, which we now understand very well. We can't pretend that we don't know what's going to happen if we stay on this path. Um, I, I think that was the last of my charts. Okay. Let me just check. Just, is there one more or not? Oh, yeah. So, so this is the, the path we're on, you know. The, the, to pretend that what we're doing is having any effect, you know, it might slow down the rate uh, of growth, but that's not what's needed. Science tells us we have to actually reduce emissions rapidly. And furthermore, the economic studies show that if you put an honest price on, fossil, on carbon emissions, you would reduce emissions rapidly. But if you don't have that price on there, you're not going to reduce the emissions. You will reduce the emissions someplace, but then it keeps the price low, so somebody else will burn it. And that, that economic study you're referring to also found that if you put $10 per ton and increase it $10 per ton over 10 years, what was the effect in jobs? In well, health? in the case of the United States economy, that's where the study was done in detail. It was 3 million new jobs in 10 years and uh, a significant increase in GNP. So we, we, need, we need energy. But people thinking, oh, we have to do less... Well, yeah, we should have energy efficiency, but that would be encouraged by a rising price. Uh, but we do need energy. We need energy to raise the poor people out of poverty. That's the best way to keep population under control. Those countries that have become wealthy now have fertility rates that are below the replenishment level. So we need, and the w reason they these countries became wealthy is because they had energy, and that energy was fossil fuels. Unfortunately, we can't continue to use that as the mechanism to get out of poverty. We need to have clean energies, and the way to make that happen is to have this. We, I, you know, I've met with um, captains of industry, I call them, leaders of n not only utilities, but even uh, oil companies. These people have children and grandchildren. They would like to be part of the solution. If the government would give them the right incentive by putting this across the board rising carbon fee, they say they would change their investments and they could do it 
rapidly. So it's not that the problem can't be solved, but it's not being solved. And nothing that I've heard so far indicates that we're intending to, it's not, it's not too complex. It's the simplest approach you could have. It's Just have an science. honest, uh, simple, rising carbon fee. So, so how do we solve it? Now, if you'd switch back to my computer. Um, there was, uh, I wanted to do a, uh, uh, a little bit on one of the solutions that Dr. Hansen was talking about last night. Can you change back to the MacBook, please? Well, let me talk about it before we get it up. We'll, we'll have it in a moment. Um, there's a, a, a movement that's begun in the United States, and I believe yesterday was an international launch. In the United States, it's called the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, internationally, I believe it's called the Citizens Climate Engagement Network. Here we go. Let's move on. At this point, I wanted to switch to a non-commercial message. You're used to commercial messages in TV shows. There we go. I'm at the, approximately the distance that this will work. So this is the citizensclimatenetwork.org, uh, and I encourage you to go to it. It's been rather successful in the U.S. It's grown leaps and bounds over the year. Every year, a group that grows exponentially comes together and lobbies Congress. Every single member of Congress or their staff ha has a meeting with people from their, their state, their constituents. It's been very effective. These people all year round write uh, letters to the editor, op-eds, um, and it's being expanded internationally. It's got to go from ground up if we're going to put our leaders' feet a little closer to the fire because there appears to be some other birdie whispering in their ear uh, advice that is not in the best interests of best welfare of current and future humanity. Now, I've been asked also, there we go. Dr. Hansen is one of four scientists who will do a press conference tomorrow that's open to the public. This is outside the COP, but in Le Bourget at the Air and Space Museum. Um, I encourage you to uh, attend that. It's just a short distance away, so if you're in the COP, you can go and come back. Uh, if you're seeing the webcast, uh, please encourage everyone distribution through your, your list to anyone who's in Paris to come to uh, Dr. Hansen's uh, presentation tomorrow, which will also be eye-opening. Now, we do have uh, a, a bit of time left so we can entertain a few questions from the audience. Wait, wait for the microphone. Uh, I would like to know what kind of agreement you expect at the end of this summit. What would you like it to be? And you said that this carbon price is not happening. So what, what happens after Paris? What are the next steps you see? Yeah, well, we have to have that agreement. And I think that story will be clear fairly soon if it's not at this conference. And, and frankly, it does not require 190 nations to get together. But, uh, the, you know, the United States, China, European Union, the main players, if they would agree, and even if two of the three would agree, you could make it happen. So it doesn't, it, it, um, doesn't look like it's going to happen here. Uh, but it has to happen soon. The other thing that needs to happen is uh, the technology development. It has not, and, and uh, the thing that I'm doing a week after this is over is going to China because I, it's, it needs to be led in China because they have the need for more energy. They have the ability to fund it, and but but still you need to have this spur, and they want to clean up their atmosphere, so they've got to find something. Uh, alternative to fossil fuels, but um, 
we have we have to uh, the danger is if we go several more years if we go to an, an, the next uh, UN meeting it we we may have pushed the system beyond the uh, beyond the tipping point for the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet that's already questionable it's we don't understand that well enough to know that we're warming the ocean and it's going to have some effect. So we really have got to get things to happen soon. Uh, the gentleman in the second row. Okay, yeah, um, Dr. Hanson, uh, David Holmes from the Conversation in Australia. Um, uh, your preference is to look at uh, parts per million as, as, as targets, uh, but given that the conference's terms of reference are in terms of temperature, well, where would you draw the line from a science standpoint on, on what is dangerous climate change? Because, you know, two degrees being put up as a guardrail, uh, is, is that already dangerous in your view? Yeah, absolutely. Two degrees would make it warmer than the Amion, in which sea level was six to nine meters higher than now. We don't know how long it would take to get there, but two degrees is, is definitely dangerous. Um, so we're at a point now where this year uh, temperature is going to hit the one degree mark and there's more in the pipeline. Of course, that's a, 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 the El Nino is kicking that up. It'll drop back below one degree, but it's on a path where it's going to go above one degree. Even if we reduced emissions five or six percent per year, we would still hit about 1.1 or 1.2 degrees. So there's, uh, but if we would get emissions to go down a few percent per year, which we could, five or six may not be practical, but a few percent would be practical, then temperature would peak at something like 1.5 degrees and then start to go down. And that, that would, uh, is, is perhaps the best that we could uh, hope for. But that does require a price on carbon. No, I believe we're, we're out of time, so yes, I just got the, the one minute, so um, I will say that Dr. Hansen will re be able to remain for a little while, yes? Yeah, sure. And, and answer some questions in the hall. So um, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, please f feel free to email me, and I can perhaps relay your questions to Dr. Hansen's secretary if you can't stay. Uh, there's my email address, and, and thank you very much.